Good morning. My name is Soumya Munjal. I'm a board member of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council um, and Town Hall, and also a founder of an ed tech company called Youthful Savings. Thank you so much for joining us today's live stream and how education is changing in a COVID-19 world. If you're enjoying our free webinars and would like to join the effort to keep them coming, we've just launched a new platform that makes giving easier than ever before. Stay tuned at the end of the program for details and how you can pledge your support. For those of you joining us online, we will be taking questions from you in about 20 minutes. You should see a control panel on the right hand side of your screen with an area for questions that you can type in. The council's communication manager, Claire, will join us to read them during the question portion and we will get as many as we can. So please keep them coming. Our speakers today are Nick Melvoin and Justin Pigeon. Nick is a LA USD school board member, and Justin is a former principal from Uncommon Schools in New York City. They both come from the largest cities in America, and I'm looking forward to learning more on their thoughts on education in a COVID-19 reality. Hello, Justin. Hello, Nick. Hi there. Justin, I'd love to get just a brief bio of your uh, experience and where you come from. Absolutely. And so I've been working in urban education reform for over 14 years. Uh, I started out as a Teach for America core member. I taught in Houston, Texas. Uh, then I did some work with Yes Prep Public Schools, and then I came to New York City, where I helped found a school as a teacher and eventually became the principal um, and stayed with that organization for over 11 years. And that's been my journey up to this point, and now I'm entering the world of educational consulting. Awesome. Great to have you, Justin. Nick, would love to learn more about you and your experience in education. Yeah, so like Justin, I also started through Teach for America. Um, so I'm originally from LA, and then after graduating from college in 2008, came back to LA to teach middle school uh, in Watts. Um, and that really opened up my eyes to kind of the systemic inequities in LA Unified and in education writ large. Um, I had the good fortune of starting to teach at the height of the recession, and so got laid off every year. Um, the way we lay off teachers in California is based on seniority and our um, you know, our least senior teachers are at our hardest to staff schools. And so that really got me involved in advocacy and actually some litigation against the school district to protect teachers at these uh, hard to staff schools. And so went to law school um, and then worked briefly in Washington uh, in the Obama administration and then came back uh, and started organizing parents, teaching uh, at Loyola Marymount School of Education and then ran for the board and have been serving on LA Unified School Board, representing the West Side and the West San Fernando Valley for almost three years to the day. Awesome. Well, we're so honored to have you and we're just gonna jump right into it. This, this pandemic occurred, right? And education was just toppled, um, changed completely. And I'd love to learn more about your experience and how education affected your communities um, and how education was delivered, and what, if, whether it was your district or your school and kind of what you went through. We'll start with you, Justin. Great. Yeah, so we were certainly uh, surprised that we had to build a virtual school basically uh, overnight uh, early in March. We shut our schools down in March, uh, March 13th, if I remember correctly, in New York City. And so for us, uh, school instruction, it looked a few different ways. Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to make sure that uh, every student had access to the same uh, level of education, same material, same types of instruction. And so before our kids left, we sent them home with uh, work in math and reading. And then the, when we thought about equity, uh, the one piece of technology that we knew right from the beginning that every student had was a telephone. And so our education, our plan actually started with telephone tutoring calls of the packets, the physical packets that we sent students home with. Uh, eventually, we were able to move to an online platform uh, where we went to Google Classroom. Uh, that also required an in-depth uh, process for making sure that every student had access to both either a, at least a smartphone and also uh, internet. And so if a student didn't have access to that, that's something that the school had to provide. Uh, we had to provide hotspots, we had to provide uh, iPads, and again, we did this from a place of what we didn't want to happen was the students that had access to better tech to get a better education. 
that was not in our in our plan when it comes to equity and reaching all of our students. And then once we had the virtual learning set up, uh, we moved on to in classroom Zoom teaching. Great. Yeah, and 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 in LA, I mean, similar story. I think just rather than you know doing it at a school level for a system level. Um, you know, it was a, a really tough decision to close schools because I think this crisis has has been sitting on top of an exacerbated existing crises that many of our families face. So LA Unified, 82% of our kids are living in poverty. And so we serve three meals a day to most students. And so it wasn't as, as easy of a decision to say, okay, we're going to close and do virtual learning because we needed to figure out how we're going to maintain the social safety net. I did think closing was the right decision. We closed on March 13th, actually before New York City. And I wrote an op-ed over the weekend in the New York Times about our decision making. Um, you know, and I think it was a day or so later that New York closed. But you know, I think just thinking through this, the same concerns, which is how do you maintain that social safety net in a in a virtual environment? And so we closed on a Friday. On a Wednesday, that next Wednesday, we were operating what is still the largest food bank in the country. So we have 64 of our schools throughout the county that are serving up to three meals a day, not just, I should mention, for families of LA Unified students, but for anyone. About 20% of uh, the people we're serving are adults. Um, and so we're looking for reimbursement from the city and the county. But so our first thought was, how do we make sure that we're still getting these basic services to families? Second phase of the kind of triage was that we knew that about 120,000 students didn't have access to a device or to the internet. And so we made an emergency procurement of nearly $100 million. And it so far um, in the last few months have, have uh, passed out over 200,000 iPads, Chromebooks, laptops, hotspots to make sure that kids had access to the internet. You know, I heard from some constituents two th or three days after we closed and they were asking, why aren't we just doing Zoom lessons as if it were in person? Um, and, you know, my first response was, kids don't have access to the internet. Then when we made sure they had access to the internet, we also um, did a procurement of free headphones for uh, all of our high school students because many students didn't have a quiet place to work. Um, and then we had to train our teachers, many of whom had their own childcare issues to deal with. And so we did a professional development course um, where every teacher was trained in distance learning. We had about half of our teachers, so 15,000 educators, sign on for another 30 hour, what we called micro-credential in distance learning. Um, you know, and then it took us to a point where every kid had access to a device and the internet, teachers were trained, um, and then we had to figure out how to, how to work through these various platforms, Zoom, Google Classroom, like Justin was saying, and figuring out how to meet the needs of students at different grade levels. And that has been a process that we're still learning. Um, and as we do digital summer school and virtual learning in the fall, which I know we'll talk more about, uh, I think we've built on that foundation where really overnight we had to transition 700,000 kids and 60,000 teachers uh, or 60,000 employees to digital learning. I have a question for you, Nick. Now you mentioned that 82% of public school students in LAUSD are in poverty. So that means that they're getting the Title I, Title II funding, or you're supposed to get that, right? I read an article, um, it was it, it, it was for the, the teachers union, uh, created a, a research-based article, and they mentioned that $3,900 per kid is missing from that budget. So you're supposed to get 30, an additional $3,900 per student it needs to come in your district in your entire school district in order for you to even meet the needs currently now you have a pandemic that is occurring what do you guys need in order for you guys to give the kind of education that is necessary for these kids and what do you what can we what do you propose needs to occur in order for you guys to do your job yeah it's such an important question and i think one of the challenges is that as schools have have taken on this new role of providing the safety net. Like I mentioned, meals. We provide free glasses for kids, free oral health screenings, now free technology and the internet. We've been doing it in the absence of other governmental institutions, the county, the city, the state stepping up, and yet we're under-resourced. And so, you know, I'll be the first to say, money doesn't solve everything. And I've seen one of the reasons I ran for the board is because it's how you spend that money. And the district needed to have a lot more accountability. But 
I will say that we get about a third, well, about half to two thirds as much money per child as New York City public schools. We get, uh, you know, about sixteen thousand dollars per student, and New York City is about. 25, 26,000, and Justin can weigh in for his school. And then if you look at a private school, an independent school in LA, you look at a tuition of maybe $35,000. And so we're trying to do more with less. Some of that, to your point, is in the federal government underfunding us for both, um, particularly students with special needs, where we spend over a billion dollars a year serving students with special needs in LA Unified, and the district, uh, the federal government is supposed to reimburse 40% of the costs that's written into federal law, and yet they are at about the 14% range. Um, and then a lot of it is at the state level, you know, and before turning over to Justin, I'll say that we pride ourselves in California as a very blue state and being very progressive, but we rank near the bottom of states when it comes to per student funding. Um, and because 90% of our funding come from the state and only 10% from the federal government, it's easy to point fingers at Trump and, and Betsy DeVos, and I will be the first to do it, but it's actually our state legislature that funds most of our public schools. And we, that, that's where the underfunding is, um, is really being felt. Great. And Justin, you had mentioned that, you know, really quickly did um, an equity test and figured out who had what products. How did you fill those gaps and what more needs to be done so that technology is available? Because there's kind of a twofold issue. A, the kids need the technology, but then we also have to do the challenge of how do we provide quote unquote daycare for these kids, right? Because if these kids are working from home, what do you think is needed um, in order to solve that challenge as well? So both the, the, the technology that's needed, what did you do in the past? What do you think is going to work in the future and how do you think we'll solve this how do we keep our kids busy and allow parents to uh work as well because i think that's probably on everybody's mind right now absolutely yeah the, the first step with technology it was an audit just a pure audit what students had what we needed to provide but then um to the point that nick makes you also have a limited budget and so it's not like we could provide every student with a laptop um, and that's why we had to start with something as small as a smartphone and then uh, and obviously a smartphone is not an ideal device for a student to work off of, but with our limited resources, we knew that that's what we were going to have to do. And then the second, once we got those uh, systems you know, up, up and running, technology itself doesn't educate children. And that's one of the things I think a lot of people staying at home realized is that even when you get the technology out there, uh, now the next part is, well, how do you teach children how to access the technology, let alone the content that is in the instruction? And I think what a lot of parents found is that they ended up either having to help students with one or help students with both. Uh, and a lot of our teachers ended up uh, finding that they had to also be involved in this process, not just with the student, but with the family as well, making sure that the families um, understood how students were being accessed, how to how to uh, access the curriculum, how to complete certain uh, assignments. And so when I think about, you know, when we think when we are thinking deeply about what's it going to look like in the fall, uh, we have to be ready to solve all of these challenges because it's no longer a situation where a parent can drop a child off at school. The school can provide both the safety net and the instruction uh, and then send the student home. Even if a student's at home right now and the school's providing the instruction, a lot of what Nick mentioned is true. Our, our students still need to eat. They still need meals every day. Uh, they still need structure in their schedules and they need uh, a way to be able to provide that. And so what schools are, what schools will be able to do is provide some of that. We will be able to provide schedules. We will be able to provide uh, the, the schools that are doing virtual learning better. will be able to provide online classes where students have to sit in uh, on the computer at a certain time. However, that won't make up for the lack of supervision at home. And so it's a fine balance of how do you teach students to independently uh, access the te technology, learn, work on their own, while they're still going to need some type of uh, supervision and, and assistance. You know, I read this article on CNN where in Brooklyn, they were utilizing um, co-working spaces, which are probably underutilized at the moment. And so a neighborhood was coming together, putting their kids into a classroom, and then maybe a parent that stayed at home was taking the responsibility to, um, you know, teach the kids. And I thought that was like a really a cool solution. I think there's going to be probably a lot of coordination that needs to occur in the public and private relationship. But I think one thing's for sure is that 
change is on its way, it's going to cost money and it's never been a better time for innovation. Um, now, I mean, a really important question is how did the youth adapt to the change and what more do you think we can do as educators to make this change easier and more beneficial and does it really have the ability to ultimately give youth a better education? I'll, yeah, I'll I mean so we'll start with Nick and then I'd love to hear from Justin as well. Yeah, so I'll start with kind of the individual and then go to the, the systemic view. I mean, I think, you know, March 12th, we were telling kids, especially younger kids, that they should stay off their screens and that we're limiting screen time. And then March 13th, we're saying now, you know, you should be on Zoom six hours a day. And so I do think, you know, we, we have still tried to figure out that balance between the synchronous live instruction, the 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 screen time, and then also, you know, I know Justin started talking about this, but the packets and the cell phone and just like even talking to your teacher on the phone. Um, because I do think that, well, this has created opportunities around tech. There are still a lot of guidelines around, especially younger kids, being on screens and being on devices. So I think, you know, at the individual level, especially for younger kids, you know, it's hard, it's impossible to replace the in-person experience in part because a lot of school isn't just academics. It's the social emotional support. It's the mental health support. It's the um, athletics and, and nutrition. Um, so I, I think it's easier for our older kids who are more like, you know, college students who can work from home, can be on their laptop. Um, and I think that actually transitions to, transitions to my thoughts on the system, because I, I do think that there are systemic changes that can come from what we've learned in the last few months. You know, one is I do think that we are behind some of the more developed countries in the world in thinking about high school. You know, I think that four years of high school uh, without cross dual registration in a community college or a certificate, or I, I think is something that we really need to re-examine for students to be able to look at whether that's vocational education or getting their associate's degree or enrolling in college courses. You can do that with technology. I think it can make the high school experience much more relevant and you could get kids graduating high school with actually you know, skills to go into the workforce if they wanted to or to go on to higher education. I also think that we have seen that in digitizing information, kids may, can, have access to a lot more that's out there. And so for some of our smaller schools, if they don't have a certain AP course, now maybe they could take it at another school across town. LA Unified is 721 square miles. So it's not feasible for a kid to maybe drive to another school for one course. But now if they wanna take AP um, Calc BC and that's not offered at their school, they can maybe take it online. I also think that we have some incredible educators in all of our school systems. And being able to, to videotape them and see them via Zoom and have them deliver content. And this is kind of the basis of the Khan Academy and a lot of the idea of the flipped classroom. But to have like our best educators do a great lecture on To Kill a Mockingbird, where every kid could have access to that great lecture. And then teachers in the individual school sites could, could tutor and help kids with their writing and actually dive into the material. I think there's a lot of possibilities there that we have been slow to adapt, but that this can help usher in, which is how do we kind of take what's the best of technology um, and pair it with, with the best of in-person instruction and the needs for our teachers. I think, you know, if the fear among some teachers unions was this shift to digital instruction was going to render them irrelevant, I think what we're hearing from parents is like, no, we need more of our teachers, we need live instruction. And so I think there's a way to harmonize the two. Absolutely. Um, I run an online learning platform, so I can tell you that it's been super exciting to be able to take kids from New York and blend them to kids in LA and even take them to Australia. So I think that there's a lot that can be done. Um, now, Justin, you're now transitioning to a consultancy role. So um, is your hope to consult people like Nick um, how to merge remote learning into a long-term plan. Like perhaps there's a vaccine and, you know, we go back to crowded classrooms or we go back to the way things are. Do you think that there's a way or there's a push to, to utilize this time to completely innovate how education is transformed? Or do you think that we'll go back to how it was? And what would you recommend? Absolutely. So my, my first to answer your question, my consultant role is going to focus on training teachers and principals 
primarily on how to do virtual instruction. Uh, particularly, as we know, many of the systems are going to be set up and going, but that does not necessarily mean it's going to yield in great instruction. And so teachers, uh, as we come in the fall, they need to be equipped of how, what does a great Zoom classroom look like? What are the techniques that I can use? And the same thing with leaders who can jump into classrooms, assess how their teachers are doing, give some tips, help them grow. Uh, we still need that process in place. And so in particular, I'm going to be focusing on what does a great virtual classroom look like? And to, so to answer your question, yeah, virtual classrooms are not going to ever replace in-person classrooms. We saw that in particularly uh, with COVID. And I think uh, you know one of the pure reasons is just the amount that you can cover online versus the amount that you can cover uh, in a classroom. And so then, uh, like Nick said, so you had some blending learning models that are coming like Khan Academy and other academies that are basically blending the learning that's happening in classrooms and virtually. And I think we're going to see a lot of that, but I think uh, be, before we get to that, I think you know, we're gonna have to figure out what does great instruction look like for our students? Not just do we have great systems, are they up and running? Does everyone have access to them? Because even when you have great systems, you're still gonna have a percentage of your population that is struggling to learn. Um, Nick mentioned earlier, students with special needs, you're still gonna have to find ways to give those students modifications. You're gonna have to find ways to uh, teach at the same level of rigor that our students need when they go to prepare for things like the SAT. These assessments that we use to get students into college you know, are not going to change. And so while our virtual systems may change, what's important to me is that we're maintaining rigor and that we are not allowing our students to develop academic gaps, especially when we know in urban areas that these gaps are already persisting and I would hate to see them widen. Well, speaking about the gaps, tech equity you know, is a big thing. And one of the reasons why I got into the online learning platform and working with schools such as Justin's was because I wanted to help bridge the gap and get kids access to technology. And we were lucky enough to utilize Google Chrome's in order to do that. But that's a huge thing now, right? And some of these youth that, you know, 82% in poverty, the technology that they receive from a school district might be the only technology they've gotten, you know, generationally. So what are your thoughts on tech equity? How do you think that we're going to approach that? And is that possibly, you know, there's a lot of feedback on remote learning and a lot of it's negative, but is there a way to really solve socioeconomic issues through delivering really innovative education and funneling more um, funding towards bridging that tech equity gap, which can ultimately change the life of a kid? I mean, remote learning and giving a kid a computer might make them a programmer and all of a sudden they're out of poverty, right? And I think if, is there, you know, is that some, an optimistic angle that you guys are seeing or, uh, you know, what can we do to really push um, the, the narrative around tech equity in a positive angle? I think it's a huge point and I think it's one of the opportunities that does come out of this crisis. I mean, I think that the last few months have shown that internet access is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. You know, in California, we have a fundamental right to education in our constitution. If that education is online, I would argue that access to the internet is a, is a constitutional right in our state. And yet we still have pockets um, where students don't have access, a lot of the rural areas of our states, but also in LA. Um, and so I think when you look around and see small cities, you know, like Chattanooga, Tennessee have universal free Wi-Fi access, but LA doesn't. Um, you know, I brought a resolution to the board that said we need to be advocating at the state, um, federal, county level for free access. Because like I mentioned, we're, we're spending tens of millions of dollars on hotspots to kids. That money is the same pot of money that could be going to pay teachers, lower class size. That should be someone else's responsibility. And I think access to, you know, uh, broadband is crucial. And not just for education. I mean, this is the first census that is online. You mentioned so me earlier, the type of federal money that we get, that's all based on the census. And so if people don't have access to fill out the census because they don't have internet access, we lose money. And so I think it's so crucial. And then like you said, I think that, you know, we have some wonderful partners like Code for America, uh, DIY Girls, Girls Who Code, all these great nonprofits, Nine Dots, that uh, once kids have that technology can do so many incredible things and, and open up doors for students. And so I think that, that tech equity is one of the opportunities here. I'll also just say that one of the challenges that I fear right now, especially going into distance learning in the fall, is that you do have the opportunity for some kids to really um, accelerate their learning because they're going at their own pace. 
we are hearing a lot of um, families talk about these little learning pods and have tutors and like you said, use WeWorks and other, th maybe a parent can stay home. 82% of our students don't have those same opportunities. And so I'm really, you know, as we think about how parents are adapting to the needs of the fall, and I so understand their desire to say, we need a tutor, we're gonna have these home pods. I would do everything I can if I were them. It also means that the, the achievement or opportunity gap between our students is gonna grow because we're gonna have some who have that pod digital hybrid and then others who, who don't. And so that's something that I know we're thinking a lot about at LUSD. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my mom is a stay-at-home mom, and I told her that if we could just get every stay-at-home mom to be in charge of a pod, um, you know, there's something that we can do. But I, I do believe that there is so much innovation in policy that can occur. Um, but, you know, how do you think that we as constituents can do our part to push some of the policy that you guys are speaking about? Because at the end of the day, my personal opinion is that education is just pushed to the side all the time. And I can't think of anything that's more important than educating young people. And I think that as the world gets more complicated, the best that you can do is just take our learnings as adults and try to get kids to be the change. And so what do you think we can do as constituents to A, learn more about what the struggles are, but at the end of the day, it, it, you know, public education is state and federally funded and the decision makers are above my pay grade. <laughs> so, but um, we are constituents. And so what do you recommend that we can do to A, learn more about the challenges that you guys are facing, but also just get more involved um, as constituents to hold our elected officials accountable? What, what do you recommend? I'm happy to jump in and then, and then hand it to Justin, but I would say, you know, a few things come to mind. I think one is, to those of you who are joining us today, thank you. I think it's so important to learn about these issues. I think most people don't realize that LA Unified is 82% kids in poverty, that we're only 10.5% white, that we're 90% of the students in our schools are of color, that um, we do that we are so underfunded. And I, I think educating ourselves is so crucial here. Um, another issue in LA, and you know, New York is, is slightly different, but similar problems in LA, a lot of families in the last 30 or 40 years who could opt out of public education did. And I say that as one of those kids. I started in LA Unified and then ended up in private school. And so one of the reasons that I think we don't acknowledge sometimes the challenges of the public school system uh, is because we're just a lot of the decision makers in the city, those who vote, those who um, support candidates don't have uh, students um, in the schools. And so I think that's, you know, just an important point. I also think getting involved in local elections, you know, I think we all, and I'm sure this is true in New York as well, like everyone's focused on November and the federal government because every hour there's a new tweet that makes our hair on fire. But really these decisions are state and local. I mean, the decision that the school board has, the decisions that the state legislators have, and those turnout, you know, turnout for those elections is so paltry. And I think that like to those of you watching, you probably could tell me what Trump said an hour ago, but if I asked you who your uh, state senator was or who your city council member was, you, you probably wouldn't know. And I think it's so important to inve kind of invest in, in local politics. And obviously I'm biased because I'm a school board member, but that's where the action is on so many of these things. But it is also very intimidating as a constituent to hold elected officials accountable. I just had an, an issue with a mayor of the city of Santa Monica and the way that he spoke to me, it's very intimidating. Um, so I think that it is important for us to remember that our tax dollars go to elected officials. And if we have issues, it is, that is democracy. It's us holding our elected officials accountable is democracy. And the more that we can become organized in it, I think would be great. Um, okay, yeah, and so then the last thing I'll say to that point, because it's so true, but it, it is also on us. And the reason I ran for the school board is because like, we have to show that investing in public education, that there's a good return on that investment. And I think for so many urban school districts in the country, there's not. And so I, I get the people who say, I don't want to give more money to the public schools because I read the headlines and you're not serving kids well. And I think there's a lot we're doing and we're improving. But, you know, so I'll also just own that this isn't just about give us money. I mean, we need to show that's and again, that's one of the reasons I ran that like we're going to make sure you have the best teacher in the classroom and that we're not going to have money go to, you know, iPads uh, years ago, the big iPad scandal and waste taxpayer dollars. So it is that balance of investing in, in public schools in the community, but then us proving that we're gonna you know, use that investment wisely. Absolutely. 
Um, one final question, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. If you had a magic wand, how would you reform education? Three sentences or less. <laughs> All right, so I'll take it. I think, uh, you know, sim similar to your school district that in my school personally, we had 87% of students live in, living in poverty. Um, and so the, the number one, the first thing our students need is more access to mental health and mental health systems. Um, in particular, if it up to me, the first thing I would change is that every school would have a school psychiatrist, a school psychologist, and a team of social workers uh, to support the community. Whereas in my school, I was given one social worker for 365 students, right? Uh, eventually was able to add a half a social worker, if you would, I call it half, but I think uh, just having access. I think what, you know, what Nick started with is that schools don't just provide education, we provide schools with a safety net. And so if students aren't coming to school and they're well fed and they're not feeling safe and they're not feeling secure and they're not feeling heard and they're not feeling cared for, then learning is always going to be an obstacle. So first and foremost, I think we have to focus on the health of our communities and make sure that our students are being well served there. One thing I just add is universal preschool. You know, I think that like the research is so clear here and parents know it and yet, you know, so by the time kids come to kindergarten in LA Unified, they're already behind. And if they're not reading by second grade, it's almost impossible to catch them up. And so kind of universal early childhood preschool, um, which requires state funding, but you know, I think that would be huge and can be a game changer for so many of our students. Awesome, thank you guys so much. Um, I believe Claire is going to join us now to read us some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, again, if you have any questions, please click on the question section in your control panel um, and send those over and we'll try to get to as many as we can. We really want to make this interactive. And Claire, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you guys again. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am our communications manager at the World Affairs Council and also Jessica's counterpart on producing these webinars. So nice to uh, virtually uh, be with all of you. Um, we'll kick it off to our first audience question, and I'd love to hear both of your responses to this. Um, this. This audience member said, you've done a lot to train the teachers and the students for online learning. Uh, what steps have you been able to do to ensure that families are able to support distance education? And then which of these three areas, students, teachers, and then the home environment is the weakest link, and what are the solutions um, to help this? Yeah, so, oh, Justin, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, the, the first system we realized that we needed at our school was to uh, make sure that we have communication with families. And so the first thing we did is we assigned every family a staff member that was called their academic mentor. And so it was the academic mentor for the student, but uh, within that, we held our teachers accountable for making phone calls, for having conversations uh, every week to make sure that parents were up to date with any changes that were happening virtually, anything that's happening on the platform, or to the nitty gritty level of what assignments are students still missing? And what assignments do students need and what do students uh, need to uh, drive further? And so I think, you know, it's important for every school to establish that baseline of uh, communication with families, because in, again, we're not in a school environment anymore. And so we're, we are depending on families more than ever. And then I think, you know, in terms of your second question, in terms of where do we see the biggest, the biggest gap, they're really kind of all married together. You could have um, a great teacher that doesn't know that's not necessarily skilled virtually, and then the students are going to suffer. Um, you can have uh, students that are uh, so far behind that they can't keep up with the curriculum that's being provided online, or you can have students who family members are not able to support them at home, and so then they're suffering from learning. And so I don't necessarily think it's limited to one category. I think we have to be approaching this in a threefold approach. Yeah, and I'll just add, so I think, you know, the, the district did a lot to try to reach families at this time, everything from surveys to get their thoughts on distance learning, on what we should do in the fall, to uh, tutorials on how to use the online platforms. My office did those as well. We did uh, virtual town halls on how to use Google Classroom and Schoology, how to ask the right questions, how to help your students. But you know, I think as Justin said, it's really the variable that we can control the least is the home life, not just of our students, uh, but also of our teachers. And so one of the challenges for teachers right now is that they have their own childcare issues. Uh, you know, and so I, I think that from a parent perspective, it's very understandable to say, you know, why isn't my teacher, my son or daughter's teacher online for four straight hours? 
Um, but the teacher is also figuring out, depending on where their kid goes to school, um, you know, what they're trying to do. And so I think that that's the hard, it's not that the parents are at all the weakest link. I think, I don't want to be pejorative about it. It's just that the home, not being able to control for that variable when it, you know, to say to the parent, you need to be with your kid because many of our parents are working, if not one, two jobs. Many don't speak English. Like I mentioned before, when we started this, over 100,000 families didn't have internet access. So it took a few weeks just to be able to get a connection. And I keep reminding the district that that is a, a floor, not a ceiling connectivity, but just getting 100% 100 100 of kids connected was a huge undertaking. And then you have to build from there on the actual engagement in our kids learning. And I actually think that is one of the big things, and I'd be curious what's happening in New York, but the big thing that needs to change for us between the spring and the fall is that as everyone was transitioning online, there was a lot of engagement, but there was no assessment of how this was going. So we call it, you know, we call it distance learning. Uh, we don't know yet how much kids have been learning. Uh, and I know that's a huge concern for parents, but also policymakers. And so going into the fall, as we start at least online, we really need to do more to, to monitor progress to make sure this whole experiment is working. So. Yeah, well, that actually gets into um, a few of our audience members are wondering, how are you monitoring students? And then on the flip, how are you monitoring teachers? Um, maybe Justin, you can start and then I'd love to hear your perspective too, Nick. Absolutely. Well, the, the basic systems that we set up for students was uh, assignment completion. Um, to, to Nick's point, that doesn't necessarily tell you that if social distance learning is working, but it does tell you if students are completing assignments. And so we had to start there. We had to start with student completion rates. And then uh, from, from there, we had to um, think about, well, now that students are completing the work, uh, what does assessment look like? And so the, I've seen a couple of different versions of this in the high school and on common schools. Uh, students did take assessments where they were proctored by an online virtual proctor. Uh, so my wife, for example, is a teacher and she had a Zoom classroom of 30 people where she was watching each one of them, making sure that the assessments were, that they were taking um, were being, were not, that the students didn't have any other resources to it. And so, and then at the same time, you can also provide assessments that are not being monitored by teachers, but then it's very difficult and challenging to know that if the student completed the assessment themselves. And so assessing, assessing student learning is a real challenge. And in my opinion, I think where it really needs to be done is in the virtual classrooms. At the end of each virtual class, students need to be submitting products. Teachers need to be analyzing these products to ensure that students learning, and they need to be sharing this with administrators so administrators can see the progress happening. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I think the first step, like I said, was making was getting kids connected. Um, and that was, you know, challenging enough. And I think that there were different ways to monitor that. Um, we didn't have a system to take attendance remotely right away. And I think, uh, you know, I'm sure Justin can um, attest to this as well. There are a lot of different platforms out there that teachers were using. There's Google Classroom, there's Zoom, there's Schoology, there's Class Dojo. Um, and so there, we initially did not have MOUs with all of these programs and all of these uh, software uh, platforms to figure out how to collect that data. And so it took us a while to, to get those data use agreements in place and then figure out, okay, if one classroom is using Google Classroom, but then the other classroom is using Schoology, which is our like learning management system, how do you balance those two? And so that took some work. Um, and I think too, then, you know, there was this, general feeling in the country that assessments, especially high stakes tests, like it wasn't appropriate to offer. And that wasn't just true in K-12 education where the governor suspended uh, any state testing, but you see what the SAT, the UC system and the Cal State system suspended the SAT. You also see it with the bar exam. You know, I'm an attorney by trade and I, so I been, you know, follows that stuff and the bar exam now students don't necessarily, or aspiring lawyers don't necessarily have to take it this year. I think that Unfortunately, testing in education has become a really charged word, but if you think about it as progress monitoring, like how do we know what kids are learning so that we can meet their needs? And that's where we're really working on for the fall. Because we know every year when the school year starts, we don't exactly know if kids are ready for the next grade. There's just this assumption. 
this year in particular, as kids have been out for five months. And so we really need, and, and that's one of the points of friction with our teachers union right now is over assessment. But I'm really insistent that we need some way to progress monitor so we know what kids are learning and where their gaps are. And I think for teachers, you know, it's easier for them. They can log in, uh, they talk to their supervisors, we can take attendance. But, you know, I, th I think that I have been a big proponent since joining the board on, a, on accountability, school-based accountability, teacher accountability, and how do we uh, continue to improve practice. And I think that one opportunity here is that now that this has brought the quality of instruction home to every parent, they can see some amazing examples of learning and they can see some things where it's fallen short. And I hope that that parent voice in this conversation going forward around we, I need I need better in certain cases, or I'm really excited about this particular teacher. I hope that continues because I think there's an opportunity here to really think differently about accountability and support for teachers. Um, and we can get away from testing being a dirty word and really think about how do we make sure kids are learning and, and moving uh, along each year. Great, thank you both. Um, Justin, I'll direct these to you. They're sort of more nitty gritties on teaching. So how do you teach a science lab course effectively? And then another person is wondering, how do you teach reading online? Yeah, so I think if you're if you're particularly if you're stuck to just online teaching and there's not going to be students in the classroom, uh, when you're going to teach a science lab, you're going to have to have a very clear model. The difference is that students aren't going to have the materials that you're going to have. And so you're going to have to have a very clear model. You're going to have to be pausing. It's going to have to be interactive. You're going to have to asking students what you're doing in the lab, why you're doing it, what concepts it relates to in the course material. And so it's going to be a much more virtual interactive experience. I do think it is essential that you are are still modeling the procedures for students that they are seeing the lab being done and if it's not something you can model at home um, there's a lot of great resources out there where you can find videos of different teachers doing different labs and modeling these things and so I would say for a science teacher you absolutely have to keep your model students have to see it and it has to be interactive it can't just be watch the model and go write about it and then uh, in terms of teaching reading you know it depends where students are at if you are working in the uh, K the elementary level, you're going to want students to read online with you to some extent because you have to practice fluency. So you have to hear what students are saying, you have to hear the words they're struggling with, you have to be able to correct them. And then as you get into the older grades, into uh, upper middle school as well as high school, this is where, where you want students more to prepare before the classes. You don't want to use your class time with having actually reading the text there. This is where we can trust students to come prepared, having read, and then where the teacher comes in is really driving really rigorous discussions uh, because this is the social aspects that students are going to be missing uh, when it when we move to virtual learning they're not going to have the same level of discussions that they would in the classroom and so we have to find ways to create a virtual space to create that great thank you so much um and so next uh sort of a lot of questions about how to capture student attention so nick i'll i'll start with you on this but this person is wondering i'm a they say i'm a veteran urban educator over my many years of teaching i have observed that students do not complete work outside of school what they learn is only within the context of the classroom how are we going to engage these students and hold them accountable within the context of online learning yeah, I mean, that that's the question, right? And I think that, that one of the things I have come to realize in the last few months is that there is no substitute for in-person schooling. And so for LA Unified, we're trying to get students back as soon as we can. And we can talk more about that and kind of the challenges, especially with the numbers in LA County. But, you know, we need, especially our younger kids, to your previous question about teaching literacy and numeracy, we need to get kids back. But I think that um, one of the reasons we're, we're calling the best practices and doing this training is to is to figure out how students are engaged because there's also issues i just saw a chain on twitter yesterday with teachers on whether you should require or can require students to have their video cameras on when you're teaching your class and there are arguments for and against and the ones against are really around equity and students not being comfortable with their home environments maybe their internet isn't strong enough and so to the to the questioner it becomes even more challenging when you're a teacher and you can't even maybe see your students because some have their camera turned off but i think that that's an important question mandating that every kid has their camera on has their own challenges as well and so i think figuring out individual touch points with students 
we've been doing a lot uh, to encourage teachers to have office hours. Um, you know, that's pretty common for college. It's not as common for K-12, but the idea of a second grade teacher having office hours so that they can dedicate some time each week to check in one-on-one -on -one so Justin and I could have 20 minutes in a way that we don't even get in the normal school day. Um, I think to vary the content, you know, combination of Zoom lectures, videos, there are some great, there are some great online resources, you know, game-based learning. Uh, we actually have been contracting with some game-based providers in a way that I don't think we would have pre-COVID, but to try to, you know, there's like an Oregon Trail style history game, you know, to teach kids about the West. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think it, it's that variety of content. It's, you know, we call it in education differentiated instruction, um, but trying to meet the needs of different students. And I would just say, you know, varying the group lecture versus that, you know, pods. We've had some teachers who will like, for, you know, one hour they'll do four kids and then the next hour they'll do another four kids. But, it, but it, um, it goes back to that earlier comment I made too about screen time regulations and just like we don't want young kids on screen time. We've also had some really creative, we have, we've had teachers who have gone and sat on front lawns um, and teach kids and, and you know, so hard to kind of uh, systemize that, but um, you know, just credit to teachers who are doing that because that that was really the challenge. And I don't have a great answer because I don't know that there is a great answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah so and then go ahead, Justin. Yeah, well, I think you know the, the first thing this was this was a shock for teachers. It was like, well, how do I teach virtually? And so the first thing we had to focus on in terms of student engagement was what are the techniques that we do in our classroom that work virtually, and then what are the ones that won't. And with the ones that won't, what are the tech gaps that we can fill in? So an, an example of this is if I give a student a multiple choice question on a virtual platform, instead of uh, having to say, what, what do you think this answer is, A, B, C, or D? I'm going to say to the students, if you think it's A, show me one on your fingers. If you think it's B, show me two. If you think it's C, show me three. If you think it's four, ready, set, go. And then I'm going to scan the whole classroom to see what kind of input they're giving me. And so that's a technique that I used in my classroom that teachers use that they can still certainly use uh, in virtual learning. And then you have other, others uh, that you're not going to be able to lose, such as looking at student work products. And that's where we had to switch to uh, more tech advanced options, such as like Google Forms. We found Google Forms a really effective way of getting students to write literary responses. Um, with math, we had students uh, take pictures of the work that they were doing and submit it, and then we would grade the pictures. And so I think, you know, my advice to teachers is, number one, half the things that you did in your classroom, you can still do in virtually learning. You just have to think about it a little bit differently. And then you have to, with the things that you couldn't do in your classroom, you do have to replace that with some kind of technology. And that's where teacher training is going to really come in and leader training as well. Great, yeah, thank you both. Uh, this question is for Nick. While the efforts to feed LAUSD families have been heroic, there is a group of education organizers that are greatly concerned about the quality of instruction this coming fall, the lack of professional development, and the disparity of instruction that exists in most vulnerable communities. What other efforts are being made to close these gaps? Yeah, and I'll just say, not only is this an important point, but this is a pre-COVID point too. And I think that, you know, this, that doesn't excuse anything on the district, but I'll just say that these gaps that we're seeing, the equity um, with instruction, and this is what I was getting at earlier, when now parents are in the classroom so they can see some of this up close, but, um, you know, the, the opportunity gaps, the summer learning loss, these were things that were, were pre-COVID. Um, you know, I think that one of the things I've been looking at I mentioned earlier is that we've done this online training for teachers, and we had 15,000 educators complete what we called the Future Ready Certification, which was 30 hours of professional development to learn exactly what Justin was just talking about. And what I'm really looking at is, is trying to figure out where those teachers were at. Um, are they evenly distributed between schools and communities? And can we think differently in the fall about deploying students uh, are deploying these teachers with these new certifications uh, in our harder to staff schools. You know, one of the challenges, and it's it's been a challenge that I have fought against since I was a teacher in the district, is that we we allocate teachers based on adult needs and not student needs. Meaning if I'm a teacher, I get to go and teach at this school. And if I get hired, I get hired there. And we don't, and we fund teachers based on where they go as opposed to a more student-based funding formula which is a whole nother conversation. But I think that, can we use this opportunity to think 
about, we talked earlier about resources in terms of money, but our best resources are teachers. And can we think differently about how we're allocating teachers to school sites or to this new online environment? And can we make sure that every student is taught by at least one teacher who has gone under the certification? Um, we also, I think, need to think about as we bring, as we do phase in the reopening, how are we doing it? And is it possible to, to uh, start with certain school sites, with certain communities? The other challenge that, you know, we haven't got into the hybrid model, but around the world, you know, people were looking at pods and some kids coming some days and some coming the other, but that also pre presents a real child care problem for families. And so we're also looking at um, the days that kids aren't in school, where are they gonna be? And can we provide childcare? And I think to the questioner, we're also looking at really leaning on tutors and tutoring. Because I said earlier that some parents are gonna set up the, these little pods, but a lot of our kids don't have that opportunity. And so we will be announcing in the next week or two, a pilot program in the South part of Los Angeles, in the East part of LA, and then in the Valley uh, for a tutoring program where students would be assigned tutors to kind of help them continue with their learning. Um, but I think, you know, again, that this is just not the question of COVID. This is the question of public education in urban regions, which is how do you bridge that divide? I think it's about resources. It's about making sure that kids get um, that technology. I think one last point is that as we reopen physically, I could see us phasing in first those schools and communities that were last to get online. Um, in, in a way that would be more equitable. So if your school was one of the last to get technology, um, then maybe you're the first to reopen physically so that we can really try to catch those kids up. But there's a lot of creativity that needs to go into it and a lot of deep conversations about how we allocate teachers uh, and resources. Great, thank you. Um, on, the, on the topic of reopening, we've got individuals here who are interested in the considerations, both Justin on the school level and then Nick more on the system level uh, that are being considered. How are schools going to make that decision to reopen? So Justin, maybe we can start with, with you from the school perspective. Absolutely. From, from the school perspective, we are somewhat tied to the political perspective. And so uh, in New York, whatever Governor Cuomo decides is what our school is going to do. And so the, the challenge with that is that uh, right now we are preparing for multiple different models. We have to prepare to go completely online and completely virtual. We have to prepare for a reopening and we have to prepare for a hybrid model. And so, and then until we get the final word on what the, we are allowed to do as a public school, uh, that is going to really determine and depict the model that we go with. But in the meantime, what we're seeing is a lot of different administrators planning for a lot of different uh, models because we're still not getting clear answers in terms of uh, when we're going back to school. You know, obviously that's due to the nature of COVID as well as it keeps changing, uh, so do plans. And so it's gonna require a great part of flexibility uh, in administrators in terms of thinking through which model uh, they're able to offer and how to offer each one well. Yeah, and the politics of New York have been a little fun to watch because the, the de Blasio Cuomo tension is something that we don't have in, a, in LA and California right now. But I will say, you know, if you had asked Claire three weeks ago, I would have told you that August 18th, which is when our semester began, um, that we would have a hybrid model. And the thing that, you know, a lot has changed and, and most notably the spike in cases in LA. And so we made the decision um, a couple weeks ago that because of the number of cases and the absence of testing and contact tracing that we couldn't open in person. And I'll say that, you know, I, I refer to those as like the prerequisites to opening. All the things we think about, the hybrid model and who comes on which days, that requires a certain environment, a public health environment that we don't control. And so cases in LA are nearing 10% positive infection rate. The World Health Organization recommends not reopening an economy until you're below five. Um, they also, uh, schools around the country, when, or in the world, when they've reopened, they've had robust testing and contact tracing regimens in place. We unfortunately don't have that in LA. We, you, know, it, you can barely get tested if you have symptoms. And so we made that announcement a few days later, the governor then put some more prescriptions in place. And so in California right now, schools, in, including private schools, can't physically reopen until they've been off, until the county has been off the state's watch list for two weeks. So a number of counties in California, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, um, are on the watch list for spikes in cases. And so the first step is you got to get off that watch list, which is out of our control. 
we can all do our part to wear masks and stay home, of course. But and then when you're off for 14 consecutive days, we can start making those decisions. And for LA Unified, we're going to be looking at positive infection rates. Do we have enough tests? And I will tell you behind the scenes, we're actually trying to figure out if we can procure millions of tests ourselves to test faculty and students because uh, we're just frankly not where we need to be as a county. And then we're going to be looking at those uh, hybrid models and phased reopening. It is still my hope that we get kids back physically before the end of the semester, but some of this is out of our control, especially now that the governor has put these new parameters in place. Great, thank you both. This will be uh, the final question and I'll have Justin start and then Nick, if you have anything to add. And uh, this person is wondering, what can a local nonprofit do to help students during the pandemic? Are there any services that can be provided to students, online tutors, meal giveaways, et cetera? Absolutely, I think I would say all of that. I think that you know that you can decide which one you would approach it from, the, the safety approach, which is do students have everything they need at home? Do they have healthy meals? And then uh, on the instructional approach, uh, students are going to need a lot of tutors. Uh, I think in particular, I saw we saw in our school that the students that had older siblings or the students that had family members that were eligible for tutoring them, those students did make more gains. And so there is gonna be a subset of students that just don't have access to that uh, for whatever reason. And they're, they're going to need tutors. They're going to need uh, extra mentors. And so I would say for the local nonprofits, the best thing they can do is decide which route they want to go. Are they going to work on safety and security for students? Or are they going to work on instruction? And just know that there are plenty of opportunities in schools that are willing to partner with them uh, to make this work for our kids. Yeah, and I'll just, you know, thank the community for their support so far, too. We set up a nonprofit, uh, LA Students Most in Need, right when the pandemic started, and we've received over $7 million in monetary donations and a lot of food donations. We've been using our distribution centers that are open uh, throughout the summer, these food distribution sites, and will be open in the fall to also give out everything from sports equipment to uh, toys to diapers, feminine products. Uh, and so we'll, we're taking all those donations. People can email me, nick.melvoin at lusd.net. We can connect you to local schools, like Justin said. We've actually, unrelated to COVID, been going um, through a big decentralization process, which has been a priority of mine. So we've broken up the district into 40, what we call communities of schools. It's a great way for individuals or nonprofits to get involved with their local community. LA Unified often feels like this huge bureaucracy. And so we're, you know, outside of COVID, just trying to make it a lot more responsive. And so um, I think like Justin said, either kind of figuring out what the nonprofit's niche is, everything from donating tech to food to time to money um, is really important. So appreciate the question. Great. Well, Somia, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thank you so much, Nick and Justin, for that engaging conversation. I think you've taught our audience and myself a lot to so really appreciate it. I think we're all really trying to understand how education is going to change our, our lives. So thank you. And thank you so much to our audience for joining us. Um, if you join this program, here's a way that you can pledge your support. Um, I think Claire's going to put something up on the screen. And you can simply text GIVE to this number. Uh, since the pandemic, we've been providing all of our events for free. So this allows us to continue um, providing these amazing events. So we appreciate your support. Um, you can also visit our website, lawac.org, to learn more about our organization and the young professionals um, community that I'm a part of. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe. And thank you again and look forward to hopefully one day meeting all of you in person.